Today on Tree Talk, we are discussing Populus tremuloides, or Quaking Aspen. It's called Quaking Aspen because um, it has all of the leaves have very flat petioles. So look how flat those are, uh, which makes them really twist around in the wind. Um, it gives the entire tree this very uh, beautiful, uh, shimmery kind of look uh, when it's blowing around in the wind. Um, so these leaves are a great way to begin identifying it uh, because we can compare that to two species that I think are easiest to mix up um, with this one. Um, so we have our uh, Populus tremuloides, our quaking aspen here. You can see how very fine the serrations are on the leaf. Then we can compare that to big tooth aspen, another aspen, the only other aspen that we have here in North America. And look at those teeth, the big teeth little teeth we have quaking finally uh, it is easy just by form bark general look to mix up white birch for uh, uh, trembling aspen quaking aspen um, but look how different the leaves look when you get up close um, also they do not have a flat petiole they have a rounded petiole like a lot of others but a very deltoid shape very different than these kind of very round shapes with the tip of both of our aspens but then of course you look for the margin uh, for the quaking aspen Additionally, um, the bark is always good to use for identification. Um, I guess while we are here, we can look at the buds. We have very conical buds um, uh, that are uh, somewhat distinctive, um, but the bark is a uh, kind of a lighter gray color, sort of a newspaper lighter gray color in Quaking Aspen, um, which distinguishes it a little bit from Big Tooth Aspen, which has more of a kind of darker gray, sort of a greenish olive colored type bark. Um, uh, the young material is quite smooth. Uh, we do typically have uh, sort of uh, diamond shaped lenticels in our aspens, whereas the birches have those horizontal ones, very distinctive horizontal lenticels. That's another good way to distinguish them. Um, when young, yeah, quite smooth with some lenticels uh, at the very base of Quaking Aspen and usually up kind of a little bit um, up the trunk. We'll start to get ridges and furrows, um, but I've noticed that with quaking aspen, they're not kind of fully around the bark. They don't go up super, super high, or maybe they'll go up higher on some parts of it, but then it'll be smooth closer to the ground in others. Whereas um, uh, big tooth aspen is a little bit more complete where the whole base all the way up t towards the top of the tree will have the ridges and furrows um, as it develops over time. Um, so moving away from the ID and into the wonderful other uh, things about this tree, this is a really unique and interesting tree. It's actually the most widely distributed tree species in North America. So there are populations in Mexico, central Mexico, um, pretty high elevation, but you know, in central Mexico, all the way up to Alaska, all the way over to uh, Newfoundland. Um, I have seen this tree in Nevada, seen it in Utah, I've seen it in West Virginia, um, and I've seen a lot of it here where we are in Pennsylvania and further north. So obviously because it spans an entire continent, there's going to be a bunch of different habitats that it does occupy. In some of those areas, especially out in the west, it is a dominant uh, species. It is kind of the uh, tree species of various ecosystems. Um, and you may be imagining, you know, Colorado mountains with the golden uh, aspen color in the autumn. And by the way, that is one of the other wonderful things about this species, it has a beautiful fall foliage. Um, uh, but here in the east, I more see it as just a component. Um, we are here on an edge uh, of a, a, a mature forest. Uh, we're kind of on a rocky steep embankment and it is starting to colonize this area that has pretty poor soil um, uh, because it needs a lot of open, uh, open space, a lot of sun uh, to be able to do well. Um, that's pretty much the only requirement. It'll grow well in pretty wet soils. It'll grow well in very rocky dry soils and everything in between. Um, uh, so, but typically it needs that open environment, um, not a lot of shade. If there's any shade at all, it's probably not going to do very well. If there's a closed canopy, you're not going to find aspen there. Um, what it really thrives in is uh, a heavy fire return interval. Um, it is a very, very fire adapted species. Um, so it will uh, grow, be nice and happy. They don't live very long, like many pioneer species. They're here for a good time, not a long time. So they want to come in, they want to reproduce prolifically, um, and then they will die. Um, 
when we get a fire moving through that kills the tree, um, it will sucker, it will uh, send up new stems from the roots. The roots are very spreading. Um, they'll go really, really far, but not go very deep under the soil. And that uh, disturbance, that fire, that heat uh, stimulates them to shoot, uh, send up new shoots. Um, and then if there is a lot of open sun, they will explode and you'll get a, a huge thicket of clonal aspen. So they are, they're clones. Um, so, you know, one individual root system is the individual. And then, yeah, look at that. Look at that trembling in the wind. Uh, we can't miss out on that. Um, uh, so they'll, they'll be a bunch of different stems maybe hundreds, maybe thousands uh, of different stems, maybe hundreds of thousands of different stems, um, but they, it is one individual. And so you may have heard of the, the, the organism with the most mass in the entire world is uh, a trembling aspen. I believe it is in Utah. It is somewhere in the, in the west, southwest. Um, and it covers, you know, many, many acres, um, and that is just one individual. And I believe it's quite, I think it's a million years old, this one individual aspen that just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. Now. If there was no fire for 300 years, if we did not allow fire uh, to move through that aspen stand, uh, it would likely just die because it needs that fire to revitalize, to send back up the clones. Um, if, uh, if there isn't that disturbance, also uh, sometimes forestry activities will do it. You can get in and clear cut um, and it, that typically does uh, uh, result in responding with that suckering too, but fire is really um, the way to go. Um, and so, um, that is uh, part of the things that are kind of threatening this species. You know, it's very widely distributed, very, very common, but if we increasingly are suppressing fire, we're going to have a lot less of this species. Uh, this species is really, really important besides just being super cool and exciting and weird um, uh, and uh, uh, superlative, um, really important species uh, for a lot of different wildlife. So in those habitats, um, and I, when I imagine Aspen, I'm either, yeah, imagining the West or I'm imagining kind of uh, uh, Canada or the Adirondacks. I'm imagining moose habitat. I'm imagining uh, mule deer and white-tailed deer and elk and beaver uh, and ruffed grouse and all these species. Uh, quaking aspen is very, very important too uh, for their food, for their cover, um, and for supporting the ecosystems that they are a part of. Uh, as far as human uses go, it is actually a very uh, high, highly sought after species for pulp production, uh, partly because it grows very, very fast. Um, and so you can turn it into uh, paper products and paper board, uh, particle board, things like that. So highly sought after uh, for those purposes too. So there you have it, Quaking Aspen, really cool tree. Uh, not very tall, um, but very mighty.